Why don't you do something like... Welcome, everyone. I'm told that the mic works no matter where one stands up here, so I don't need to move it forward. Uh, my name is Suzanne Blier, and it's a real honor to um, come in at the end of this wonderful trilogy of lectures by Chris Arrett and introduce him to you this evening. Uh, before I begin, I want to make two important announcements uh, of things you have to do, requirements uh, before the end of the week or a little bit later. Uh, one is the really remarkable Nubian exhibit at the MFA Boston, which has one of the great uh, collections, and Rita Fried is here right now. Uh, it is really amazing, and uh, it transforms what we think about Nubia and Africa and Egypt and the whole complex of early arts in this extraordinary region. And secondly, much smaller uh, and perhaps far less important, there's a exhibition of early Christianity and art in Africa with a lot of works from Nubia and a few from Ethiopia, which is in the on the third floor of the Harvard Art Museum. It's one of the teaching galleries. Uh, and we put it together with works from the Harvard collection. Um, and I think it transforms the way we think about how Africans in the early period shaped Christianity as well. And Rita Fried is right there. You have to stand up. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> And Skip, just so you know, I did mention her, but I didn't have her stand. I wanted to leave that to you. Uh, so uh, Professor Christopher Earhart um, Eret, uh, graduated with a PhD from Northwestern University, which as you know is one of the premier institutions for the studying of all things African. From Herskovitz to others, it's been a really center for thinking both broadly and narrowly about core issues related to the continent in both an historical and broadly uh, socio-political framework. And then he's taught for a long time at uh, UCLA, where he's now a, a distinguished research professor emeritus. Uh, and UCLA, as many of you know, is also a rich and important center for um, the teaching of things related to Africa. I'm thinking of people like Marek Poznanski and uh, Anthony Apter and many others. And here, too, um, like Northwestern, focusing on the rich cross-disciplinary ways in which things about Africa are being addressed. Um, almost anyone who studied uh, issues related to the continent knows important things about Professor Eret through his many writings. Among these, his widely disseminated and read Civilizations of Africa, A History to 1800, which was uh, recently revised, uh, which came out from uh, the University Press of Virginia, with a lot of images and other kinds of cross-disciplinary engagements which point to the important history of this continent, as well as his African Classical Age, uh, which came out earlier in 1998, uh, and argues for really a reframing of the early period in African history from around uh, 1,000 um, um, before present to around 400 of the current era. In addition to that, uh, he's published broadly on things related to linguistics, uh, reconstructing proto-Afro-Asiatic vowels, tones, consonants, and vocabulary, uh, which came out in 1995 from the University of California Press, uh, and his earlier historical reconstruction of Southern Cushitic phonology and vocabulary, published by Reimer in 1980. I think one of the most extraordinary things about linguists as a discipline 
is it's one of those fields, uh, much like my own discipline of history of the art at a certain period of time, in which one small detail can be the focus of incredibly rich and um, uh, divergent opinions. Uh, and in some ways, you can see the ways that camps form around the reading of one or another key issue uh, and how it is framed both in a narrow sense and a broader sense. And I think throughout this all, reg regardless of one or another linguistic camp, so to speak, in the reading of African history, I think what they all have done, and Professor Arad in particular, is to get us to pay an incredibly close attention to the richness of this history and how much of the historical record, and here I'm using that metaphorically, can be discerned from things that are happening both in the present and in the historical period. And I think of all of the subjects, and this has been an incredibly rich series of lectures, to my mind, one of the most profoundly important and profoundly controversial in an incredibly important way is the subject of ancient Egypt and its very Africanness. So let me let's give a warm welcome to Professor Eret and the title here of his talk, The Africanity of Ancient Egypt. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, I want, as I've been doing, to again thank the Hutchins Center, uh, the study of a the Center of African uh, Center for African uh, Studies, and uh, all the variety of people from Professor Gates and Abby Wolf on through all the great people that I've been working with that uh, are on, on their team. It's a, it's been a great experience, and this is an honor to me and uh, a great time. I've certainly been having, I hope I can make it at least uh, of some interest to you as well. So let's see if I still have my little clicker so we can change scenes. So my beginning comment here, uh, ancient Africa, ancient Egypt was in Africa. We can't really doubt that, can we? Uh, it's in the continent. But more important, ancient Egypt was of Africa. And that, of course, is not the way uh, the past two centuries of Western scholarship have generally presented its history. Uh, it's long past time, I would say, for all of us to discard a whole set of old notions about Egypt, notions rooted uh, in really the self-serving racialist presumptions of 19th century Europeans, notions that only too often people even today simply assume they've never thought to examine those ideas. They're back in the background informing our minds even when we're not aware they are. And on the historical and the scholarly level, that re-examination uh, is underway. Uh, the most recent, maybe we should generation, maybe we should say generations, the last 30 years or so, of scholars and scholarship on Nubia and Egypt are bringing together a whole new body uh, and maybe I should say whole new bodies of evidence revealing the African rootedness of pre-dynastic and early dynastic Egyptian culture. Uh, by the way, this is just going off here for a second. Uh, some of you may have seen or heard about a recent genetics article that makes uh, the ancient Egyptians out to be Levantines. Uh, let me be very clear, these findings come from one locale in a large stretch of possible locales in northern Egypt, and the finds date well after the foundational periods of, of uh, ancient Egypt. It's somewhat as if, I was thinking of this particular image, rather than investigating DNA uh, from a 17th century cemetery in Plymouth, we instead choose to investigate DNA from a later 19th century cemetery in South Boston. And then we conclude, having done that, that the United States was founded by people of Irish descent, <laughs> and that Americans were predominantly are, are predominantly Irish. Well, that isn't necessarily how the uh, writers of the article meant it to be interpreted, but that's certainly the way I've had people interpreting it to me. Even someone with a 
Coptic, seemed to be a Coptic last name from the sounds of things, uh, berating me for being such a terrible human being all these years of my whole career, forever having thought of Egypt as being African. So anyway, uh, there, there, there is a deeper problem here. Genetics may be able to tell us about uh, you know, the different elements in our individual genetic, physical ancestries, ancestries that we may have partake in, come from in our individual cells. But genes do not at all determine language. It's our own historical, cultural, life experiences, personal experiences that determine what languages speak, not our genes. And we need only look around at each other here in the room to know the truth of that. And it is these experiences also that shape our culture choices and our choice of cultural self-identification. Again, not our genes. It's our historical and cultural experiences. Now, the stories that I want to tell today explore the developments that laid the cultural and language foundations of ancient Egypt, developments beginning before, sometimes long before, 3100 BCE. Now, the foundational areas of Egypt also, of ancient Egypt, also encompassed, uh, encompassed not northern Egypt, but a whole range of lands extending far across northeastern Africa. And there are actually two ancient Egyptian foundational stories that I'd like to tell, and so that gives me an opportunity to change our slide. Well, one of these we might call the deep time story, the story of cultural and historical developments from the, seventh, uh, the, the sixth millennium on down to around 3100 BCE. And the setting of this story was what was then a wide swath of steppe grassland, not some narrow strip of habitable land just along the river, extending for more than a thousand kilometers, extending north-south from beyond the confluence of the Blue and White Nile in the south uh, to the uh, to as far north as the archaeological sites at El Badari in Middle Egypt. It was this vast stretch of lands that constituted the foundational cultural regions and the cultural heartland of pre-dynastic Egypt. But there is also a second story, what one might call the way deep time story, with its beginnings before 15,000 BCE. And the setting for the way deep time story takes us even farther south in northeastern Africa. So to give things their proper historical order, let's do first things first. Let's begin with that earlier way deep story. Uh, in doing so, we'll consider the kinds of historical evidence that I'm particularly known for applying, uh, comparative linguistic and cultural evidence along with archaeology. To excavate this history, we must set out, first of all, the language relationships of ancient Egyptian. Now, ancient Egyptian belonged to the Afroasiatic language family. Small digression here. There is an older name for the Afroasiatic family. A horrendously bad name. The alternative name, Hamito-Semitic. You recognize the name Ham, of course, here in Hamito. To still use that name today is to perpetuate the horrific invention by racists of a myth, a myth used to justify enslaving Africans. That, the, and it's the slaver's own myth, it's not truly biblical, that Ham was the ancestor of all Africans, so they could get the Africans they wanted into their myth. That God had passed Noah's curse on to Ham's supposed descendants by giving them dark skins. And even more horrifying to me, still in our own day, I've been discovering there are only too many American fundamentalist Christians who still hold to this myth. It's really shocking and sad to see. So avoid this name as if it were the plague, or indeed the seven plagues of ancient Egypt. So back to our topic. Three initiating questions this really requires from us. First, how and when did the language directly ancestral to ancient Egyptian come to be spoken along the Egyptian Nile? And answering that question requires two other questions to answer. 
where does the ancient Egyptian fit in the family tree of relationships within the Afroasiatic language family? And where were the languages of the family most probably spoken at different points along the lines of descent in the family tree, which we haven't quite yet shown you. So first we need to view the family tree of Afroasiatic. Uh, what I'm going to do is treat a little series of slides here, tracking the lines of descent of ancient Egyptian back to the original Proto-Afroasiatic language. So there that gets you to ancient Egyptian, and back through these successive earlier stages, back to Proto-Afroasiatic, the mother language of the whole family. Now, these findings, by the way, uh, are very similar to ones that have been previously published, but they, the version that is here is coming from the ongoing work of a team of scholars that I brought together. We've combined uh, some newer mathematical approaches, ones that are actually used uh, in the genetics field, uh, we, along with traditional methods of uh, working out uh, language and language family genealogies what languages are closely related to each other and which are farther and so on. Uh, a first presentation of our findings is currently in the process of publication. And, uh, well, you know, the evidence is like, oh God, so much of it. Anyway, but I'd really probably be happy to talk with people about what goes into it. And we'll have to wait a few more months for the material starts to be out and I get all the materials up online for people to see. But as I say, I'd be a little happy to talk with people about this uh, a little bit afterwards. Now, in your handout, you will see that there is a bibliography. And so on that bibliography, you can find some articles that refer to, uh, to the history and actually to a variety of different topics uh, that are related to what we're talking about. So our second question, where would the daughter languages of the family have been spoken at successive eras in the language family history? Well, to uh, answer this question, we apply some long-established standard tools for inferring historical, ge historical geography from comparative ethnography and linguistics. So on the bibliography, I did cite myself, but I cited the classic work from 1916 by Edward Sapir uh, that brought all of these different methods together, but there's been a long history of, of scholars using these in fruitful and, and very useful and, and ways that normally have worked out to give an answer that, that works in the long term. Uh, so two primary methods apply in proposing the ancient locations of people. The first is the principle of fewest moves, often called least moves, but I'm a little uncomfortable because moves should have fewest, not least, but anyway, sorry being a grammatical whatever I am here. Uh, to state this principle in plain terms, the most probable history of a, of a spread of a language family is the history that most parsimoniously, we're getting to Occam's razor here, accounts uh, for the later locations of the languages of the family. The most probable history is, in other words, the history that requires the fewest and the most direct and straightforward movements of people into new lands, people who speak languages of the family. And a second principle, uh, which is related, we might call the center of diversity principle. What anthropologists long ago discovered is that the areas where a particular complex of cultural practices shows the greatest diversity in the particular ways the individual practices are carried out or expressed is the region where the complex is usually the oldest. And the guiding idea behind this, of course, is that the longer a set of cultural ideas or practices have uh, been existed in an area, the more time it has had for people to develop in different cultures, different subcultures within that area to develop their own new varieties and new features of those uh, ideas. Well, in similar fashion, we can use this principle by, for language families. If there is a region where the earliest branching of a language family, where the earliest branchings of that family cluster close to each other, that will be most likely the region where the languages of the family have longest been spoken. So, 
how do these principles apply to ancient Egyptian? Well, the geography of the successive branchings of the Afroasiatic tree puts it beyond doubt in my mind, beyond reasonable doubt is the term I would use, uh, that one, that the family originated somewhere in the Horn of Africa in and around that region, and two, that speakers of the languages of the family then spread in a step-by-step -step succession of advances outward from the horn. So back to the family tree. And here I've underlined a few key groups so that you can see when, notice, uh, be able to identify them when we get to them. Uh, the tracking of this history begins with the first two divergences of the family. Initially, the proto Afroasiatic language diverged into two daughter languages. Each daughter language was ancestral to one of the two primary branches of the family. You can see we have a double, prim two primary branches way up at the top of the tree. One was proto amotic I hope that arrow popped up so you can see it. proto amotic uh, and that's ancestral to the Omotic branch of the family. And then there's a second proto-language, proto-erythraic, ancestral to the rest of the family. Um, we've given the name Erythraic, that is to say Red Sea, knowing our ancient history, everyone here, of course. This is the, to this secondary, this second primary branch for geographical regions that will start to become apparent as we map the next several stages in this history. Now, at the second stage of early Afroasiatic history, the Erythraic branch then itself diverged into two, the Proto-Erythraic language diverged into two daughter languages. That branch, in other words, began to develop into two secondary branches of its own. One of these branches was the, shall I go back again there, because I popped it up too quick, the Cushitic branch. Okay. Now, this branch continued over the long course of its history to be spoken in regions in and around the Horn of Africa. So we'll, uh, let's, let's see what we get here. So we'll go on to that in a minute. Now, the evidence is clear and straightforward. The first two periods of divergence in the family took place somewhere broadly in or around. I'm wondering what happened to two. There we go. Let's take it back to here. What we'll do, what we'll do is, we'll look at it this way. The, here we had. Let's look first at where the Omotic branch is located, on the map. Then, here's where the Cushitic family, at its widest expansion, it's not as widely expanded anymore, but a thousand, around a thousand BC. But it's all around the Horn of Africa. Okay, so that's our two things. The first two branches took place in and around the Horn of Africa. Now, still later, we need postulate just two further single, uh, f well, for we need the third stage of the history, we need to postulate just a single additional advance northward. The spread, if we take ourselves back to the tree, the no proto north erythraic, shall I bake its arrow pop in there? Proto north erythraic. Okay, let's take ourselves onward. It requires only a single expansion northward uh, out of the northern part of the Horn of Africa to spread the North Erythraic branch northward. And still later in time, we only have to postulate two further single expansions outward from the Egyptian corner of Africa to account for the remaining divisions of the family. With the speakers of the language distantly ancestral to the much later Semitic languages, crossing Sinai from Egypt to the Levant, and with the speakers of the ancestral language of the Chadic and Amazigh, Amazigh is what Berbers prefer to call themselves these days, a Chato Amazigh branch spreading somewhat later west from the Nile across the Sahara. Now, just how long ago did this succession of developments begin? So finally, our third step. <coughs> Archaeology excavates the material artifacts of earlier cultures. And the dating methods of archaeology allow one to then date 
the artifacts to particular periods in the past. At the same time, we can also excavate language for the linguistic artifacts of the past. How? Well, by reconstructing the culture of vocabularies, and sometimes I may use the word lexicon because I, I get a little more technical sounding now and then, but okay. Vocabulary, lexicon. Uh, the culture of vocabularies of languages spoken in earlier ages. The words used in those languages reveal to us the variety of things that the people who spoke the languages possessed, what they did, what they knew, what they believed, and so forth. If a past word had, a society had words for a particular thing or a particular activity, then at the very least, they knew of that activity or thing. If we can reconstruct whole suites of words relating to a particular area of culture, then we know that that collection of things or behaviors or ideas were a lively part of their culture. And if the cultural suites include items uh, that include words for notable features of material culture, material culture features that are liable to be or likely to be preserved in the archaeological record, we can do something else. We can search the archaeological record for the times and places where those assemblages of material cultural items occur. So what do the word histories of Afroasiatic reveal? I'm giving you a little hint ahead there. And I've also put data in your handouts. Well, the most important for archaeological correlation, the words that we can reconstruct back to earlier and earlier periods reveal that the proto-Afroasiatic people were already harvesters of wild grains. So on red, we've written fact that, oh yes, there's a subsistence vocabulary. You look in your handout, um, I've given you um, uh, particular sets of words that we can track back to each successively, well, actually successively more recent stage in history. That's the way I made up the list. So, and this economic focus then continued right down through uh, the early nodes, the early periods in the Afroasiatic uh, tree. Now, I proposed elsewhere that the adoption of grain harvesting um, was very probably a response to the climate changes around the period of the last glacial maximum. This period peaked around the 20th millennium BCE. And widely across Africa at that time, climates became drier, significantly drier. And the results in the horn would have been the shrinking back of forested areas, and the expansion of grassland areas uh, with edible wild grains, especially in the northern Ethiopian highlands and the northern edges of those highlands. So if we are to seek out archaeological correlations for this new kind of subsistence economy, now the salient question is, what would the diagnostic archaeological markers be? Well there is one particular kind of item that is determinative of this economy. And it's an item that survives well in the archaeology, much better than the grains itself. And that item is a small sickle-shaped stone blade with a particular surface feature, a kind of sheen caused by, specifically by the repeated cutting off over time of many ears of grain. Is there such a marker in the, tool of the, in, the, in the tool record of the Northeastern African archaeology? Yes, <laughs> there is. Um, now, for most, most of the period of several years around the glacial maximum, our archaeological knowledge of the farther northern Ethiopian highlands is really minimal because so few sites have been studied. But there is one notable exception. Laga Oda, which is down at the very bottom of the slide. Laga Oda is located at the northeastern margin of the highlands near the modern day city of Diridawa. And the findings of Laga Oda fit right in with the predictions of the ancient Afroasiatic word histories. And the occupation at Laga Oda dates uh, uh, back to 
around 16,000 BCE calibrated date. Already in its earliest levels, we can find those key diagnostic items, the small blades bearing the sheen, uh, the telltale sheen, shall we call it, of harvesting. Now, because we lack archeological sites from the region for the crucial foundational period immediately preceding, we don't know yet uh, how much earlier this adaptation, let's, let's put that back for a moment. Okay. Uh, Ad adaptation may have begun. My own expectation, as I indicated, is that we might, we probably we may find that wild grain harvesting goes back to the high point of the glacial maximum, maybe before 18,000 BCE. But more directly germane for our study, the earliest finds at Laga Oda belong to the era immediately preceding the first appearance of the new kind of tool and economy in Egypt. So, in Egypt, this new economic orientation and its determinative tool arrived a thousand years later, around 15,000 BCE, and these features came as part of the arrival along the Egyptian Nile of a new culture, the Afian culture, and also there's a ver variety of it a little farther uh, south of Aswan, which I'm not mentioning in case someone thought I didn't know about that one, but okay. Anyway, now, so what might account for the timing of this economic and archaeological changeover, this cultural and economic changeover. Well, in that very period, between 16,000 and 15,000 BCE, the first amelioration of the extreme dry climate of the glacial maximum began in areas on the long both sides of the Red Sea in the form of somewhat increased rainfall, actual enough rainfall on the African side and on the Arabian side uh, during that millennium to support an expansion of grassland steppe. And for our purposes, grassland steppe right through the chain of hills and middling mountains that connect the northern horn of Africa and upper Egypt, the Red Sea Hills as they tend to be called. So in effect, the climatic amelioration opened an environmental pathway in the 16th millennium for the potential spread of the wild grain harvesting co economy as far north as Egypt. Now, moving on from that, who might have been the people then that could have taken advantage and moved that economy northward to Egypt? Well, the linguistic uh, maps of the successive earlier periods of Afroasiatic divergence that we briefly looked at, they offer one strong possibility. So let's go back to those maps and we'll put ourselves at this particular stage of history. And that is the divergence of the proto-northeast Erythraic speakers out of the earlier Erythraic community. The geographically uh, most parsimonious spread line would be along the Red Sea Hills. Now, this is not a story of population replacement when we look at the archaeology. In the archaeology, some of the older tool-making techniques of previous, the previous existing Egyptian Nile people um, of before 15,000 BC got adopted into the overall Afian toolkit. The way deep time story uh, history that I'm proposing here uh, is that it's uh, in part a story of the arrival of new people from farther south in Africa, bringing a new subsistence economy and uh, cultural ideas north to the Egyptian Nile regions. But it's a story, too, of the melding of the immigrants and the existing populations into a new society with a new language and probably the adoption of new cultural ideas and practices that came along with the, new, with the immigrants. Now, one caveat archaeologically. This proposed history fits the current evidence, uh, currently available evidence, but there is one notable gap. We have no archaeology for the crucial millennium in the crucial intervening lands along the Red Sea Hills. But the history I oppose at least does raise a testable proposition for future archaeological investigation. Uh, it tells us what, we, what I am expecting we should find. Uh, the evidence of the spread of a wild grain economy in the 16th millennium BCE through the Red Sea Hills. Now, then just to go back briefly before we head, take ourselves back into Egypt, the two, back to the two subsequent eras of divergence, as we've seen, uh, hmm, I guess, did I decide not to put, yeah, I did, there we go. There's the uh, movement 
of taking a very, very early language that's much, much later going to evolve into Proto-Semitic. And we also have the later, still later expansion uh, westward, uh, the Sahara. My, I, I think we're going to demonstrate eventually that the Chadic, the Chado Amazigh movement was connected with the rise of the Holocene wet phase. So it probably goes to the uh, ninth or uh, ninth, maybe tenth or later tenth millennium BCE. Anyway, now among the Afroasiatic speakers who stayed in the lands on both sides of the Egyptian Nile, you know, changes did take place in the archaeological uh, materials over the long period from 15,000 BCE down to much later times. But here's the key point. The archaeology within Egypt indicates that overall, a broad cultural continuity extended from the Afian period down into much later times. With new developments, yes, but with no evidence, sharp, clear evidence of notable cultural or archaeological breaks. Um, Vilma Wetterström, <laughs> I love to try to pronounce names that where I can use my linguistic background, 25 years ago argued very cogently, uh, putting all these materials together, that this cultural continuity, continuity in fact extended right across the transition into the later eras from wild grain harvesting to the adoption of domestic crops, domesticated crops, and to the adoption of domesticated grains spreading in from the Levant, and also the spread of African crops from farther south, northward, into Egypt. Um, and this view continues to be sustained in more recent findings that we'll be looking at today. The existing populations of Upper Egypt, meaning from Middle Egypt southward in our, what we're talking about here, and uh, also farther north in the Fayum, they did add new crops eventually, and the new ways of producing those crops by cultivating them, but they did so without the evidence of notable demographic intrusions into their lands. Now, Time for us then, we can move on to the less deep time story. So we're back to a title page, aren't we here? Now, the story of ancient Egypt, Nubia, and Sudan in the period around 6,000 to 3,000 BCE. Now, to tell this story, I want to introduce a particular anthropological concept, the concept of a culture area. Anthropologists, as they built their discipline in the 19th century, encountered regions in more than one part of the world in which people of different historical origins had for century been involved in extensive cross-cultural interactions with each other. And because of those long histories of cultural interchange, the societies of those regions, despite having maybe disparate earlier origins, despite speaking different languages of different families, often came to share many features of culture with each other. Their lands formed a culture area, an interactive region of long-term cultural interchange and even cultural convergence. Now, I've long called in, argued in print that Upper Egypt and the Eastern Sudan belt formed just such a zone of extensive cross-cultural influences from the late seventh millennium BCE on into later millennia. And in past, I've taken to calling this long north-south extending region the Middle Nile culture area. Gets a little further up into the Northern Nile area, but a lot of it's down in the Middle Nile culture area. I've, I was presuming on my audience, but upper means farther upstream, so therefore it's to the south. And lower, and so when we say lower Nubia, that's going to come up too. Lower Nubia is nearer to the upper Egypt part, and upper Nubia is farther south because the river, you know, up river is south. Thank you, that's very useful. <laughs> so. So what, this is sort of the thing that I see. Now, quite independently of anything I might have written, this view has now become common understanding among the cohort or cohorts of archaeologists who have contributed so pa greatly over the past three decades to widening and deepening our, deepening our knowledge of those regions and those times. Uh, so in a recent article 
in the major journal Antiquity. David Wengrow and his co-authors bring these findings together. Their title is a telling one. Cultural Convergence in the Neolithic of the Nile Valley, a prehistoric perspective on Egypt's place in Africa. So maybe I didn't need to give this talk. We can read their article. In any case, they described, notice this title, Cultural Convergence, too. That's quite a strong statement about how intensive and fully uh, integrated this Inter cultural interaction is. What they describe taking place is the emergence from around uh, 6,000 BC onward across that whole expanse from a few hundred kilometers south of the Blue and White Nile confluence to as far north as El Badari in Middle Egypt of a common, by the way, there's a map in there and you can maybe start to find some of these places that I'm talking about uh, in Middle Egypt of a common, they kind of cover themselves and say a common economic culture, and they call it a primary pastoral economy. But they then go on to show that the cultural commonalities across these regions went far deeper than that. And the economy, by the way, was not completely pastoral. This is partly the, the bias of what you get to discover in the archaeology. But even little bits of the archaeological evidence, and certainly the linguistic evidence, indicate the cultivating and harvesting of grains, and certainly on the Sudan side of things, of, of other crops as well. Uh, crops we've talked about yesterday, like melons and so on. Now, from south, uh, there we go, so let's put that down. I should have let you see it up there, not just told you, shouldn't I? Okay, onward. Now, from south uh, of the Blue Nile, White, White and Blue Nile confluence to the round just a bit north of the latitude of Aswan, it appears from the differences we can detect that the participants in this history of culture interaction would have spoken languages of the what's called the Eastern Sudanic or the Eastern Sahelian branch of the Niger, the Nilo Saharan language family, a different language family, with its origins in the area of what modern day Sudan and South Sudan. From a little north of Aswan to El Badari in Middle Egypt, they would have spoken, it appears, dialects of the language that was to evolve into ancient Egyptian. Now, before we go on any further, there's something else very important for us to understand. I've kind of mentioned it previously, but we need to understand the geographical setting. For this historical period, forget the idea of ancient Egypt as a gift of the Nile. In the formative age, from even before 6000 BCE, down to around the 3300s BCE, the river was not just, a, just a, the river was just another locale of settlement within a far vaster region of human uh, habitation. In that 3000 year period, an environment and a bit from before then as well, an environment of continuous steppe grassland predominated across middle and southern Egypt, as well as far south into the Sudan. Some communities most certainly did live close to the Nile, and the locations of any early large villages probably would have tended to be along the river. But the great majority of the inhabitants of the Middle Nile culture area would not have lived along the river. They would have carried out their lives instead and their pastoral economies in the wide expanse of lands extending for some hundreds of kilometers, extending both sides east and west of the river. Now here's a map that, and it's in, in your handout, I hope we gave you the proper version. Anyway, this is a map with, a little, with no additional notations by me that it was given by um, uh, Wedgrove et al. that depict the extent of this area. You can see the dash lines, the south and the north, that indicate the regions that they're, the areas that they are pulling into this big culture area, region of cultural convergence. And uh, as the archaeology of these lands reveals, uh, these people shared much more than a common economy. They also uh, appeared uh, they also participated, to use Wengrove et al.'s expression, they participated in a long-term history of cultural convergence, as we said, with a common set of cultural ideas and ritual practices taking hold from south of the confluence to the founding regions of ancient Egypt. 
along the Nile, and here's the, this slide becomes relevant, as well as in the surrounding steppe grasslands, from south of the confluence to El Badari. Again, to quote Wengrove and his co-authors, treatments of the dead became remarkably uniform. Burials followed, quote, unquote, a common ritual template. And they did so whether the people, the local population, spoke a Nilo-Saharan language or an ancestral form of the ancient Egyptian language. Here is more than I will take us through individually, but I've, if it's supposed to be in your handout, I hope it's there. Um, here is a slide where you can see what those features were. So for e easier reference, I hope that the listing is there. So, okay. And there's a second key historical point to make here. More often than not, it appears that new features of culture, new notable features, tended to have their origins in the more southerly areas, among people who would have spoken not early ancient Egyptian, but languages of the Nilo-Saharan fa uh, family. Now, if you look back at your list of grave goods, mace heads, for example, appear first in burials in the Sudan. In the sixth millennium, it's by the fourth millennium that they finally become common in Upper and Middle Egypt. And for your fun, here's a couple of mace heads of rather famous ones, uh, late fourth millennium kings who were involved in the lead up developments to the consolidation of Old Kingdom Egypt. The one on the left uh, is, can uh, be connected with the king known as Scorpion. Uh, the one on the right is for Narmer, who is either, in some people's view, the founding king or the king just before the founding king of the Old Kingdom. So, a couple of uh, nice little cases here. Now, similarly, prominent ceramic styles evolved out of styles that initiated farther south. Uh, to use the term of the eminent French archaeologist, uh, Beatrice uh, Midangrain, the ceramics all across the region in the fifth and fourth millennia were foreshadowed in later sixth millennium ceramics and early fifth in the Nile confluence region of the Sudan. So in witness of that, here are a few striking ceramic uh, images. It's always fun. Now these are, on, uh, these are really dark black burnished pots, but because it's an old photograph from 50 or 70 years ago anyway, and black and white, and I took it straight out of the book instead of having a first-hand copy. You don't see the real blackness, but here we can take ourselves way north from Shahinab, way down in Sudan, which you can see on your map, way up to the other end to El Badari in the later fifth millennium. And you can see also the development that starts taking place by this period of red as well as black burnished ware. So you get this combination of things. And here, fourth millennium pots, lower Nubia, that means sort of northern Nubia, south of Egypt, Nilo Saharan speaking areas. And here's also from lower Nubia. I want to point out on this one in particular, the rippling, which as far as we can see, actually begins south of Egypt and then spreads as a decorative motif northward. So here's with rippling in Kustul and onward with some early things and even taking us on to Kerma in the third millennium. We're back in, we're in upper Nubia. I mean, a lower, uh, upper Nubia here, so. <laughs> I, I'll get mixed up too. Wow, <laughs> here we go. And those really are still making black burnished ware, but again, it's a photograph that takes away the beauty of, of that burnishment. Now, that's not the only evidence. We also have ling lexical evidence, linguistic evidence, and not Surprisingly, at least one of these bits of lexical evidence evokes something about the shared ceramic technology. Be nice to know exactly what jar, what kind of jar this is referring to, but the re reference is more to ones, the ones of the shapes that I showed you, because it's jar, it's not a cooking pot word. Uh, and then other word histories reveal southern influences, not just in primary pastoral economy, uh, which you can see in a, some words there like the cattle pen term. By the way, the funny way that things are written, we don't have the vowels properly from the earliest Egyptian. And so what you're getting is the consonants. The three is my attempt to represent 
how the aleph, the glottal stop representation anyway, which regularly at the end of words I've been able to show in my reconstructions, very often regularly comes from an earlier R, and then you, you can see the R in the Nanoseran version that it came from. So at the same time, there were crops spreading north, not just south from the, from the Levant, into Egypt, but from the, from the no, southward from the Levant, but northward from the Sudan, and so you see there the, water, the watermelon term, but there are other other ones, musk melons and uh, bottle gourds and uh, such, moving northward. Uh, castor oil, the castor oil plant, also, but not ones that we, I can't tras, track the word on on the uh, castor oil plant. Anyway, so another arresting body of archaeological evidence exists relating to the ancient sharing of ritual and belief across this culture area. In the 5th millennium BCE, Nabta, you can find that if you look on the map, it's between, kind of off to the west, uh, south of the first cataract. 200 kilometers, 250 kilometers southwest of Aswan, this was a major ritual center with astronomically oriented megalithic arrays. So here are three slides with some of the remnant finds that we, uh, they're all over the place there, but anyway, this is uh, one particular set of slides. Here is one where you see on the left the archaeologist's reconstruction of how they were when they were still upright. And I give you a third one just to uh, give you an idea of how demanding the transporting and setting up of the individual microliths must have been for the people who lived in that era. era. Think Stonehenge, you know, and yet we are 3,000 years earlier than Stonehenge. Uh, okay, and, and the other sort of materials around about indicate that this is more of the nilo saharan speaking areas uh, where this ritual center was. Now, the initial uh, Astro, 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 archaeoastronomic, there I can talk after all, studies of Nopta megaliths by Fred, Fred Wendorf and particularly the scholar who was involved in doing the interpretation, uh, J. McKim Malville, uh, argued that there were three primary megalithic alignments. There's a possibility now of one or two more others. Two of the arrays uh, lined up with the heliacal rising point of Sirius, and a second, the heliacal rising point of the belt of Orion, and maybe particularly if Malville, Kim, McKim Malville was right, uh, the middle star of the belt, but anyway. Uh, and the third and longest array pointed toward the Big Dipper, toward the north sky, uh, the parts of the sky where the stars never set. Now, more recent studies suggest that Nabta, more recent archaeological studies, served probably for centuries as a ritual center, not just in the fifth millennium, which these particular alignments date to, but uh, that it served for centuries as a ritual center with possibly the founding times as early as the late seventh millennium BCE. Now, there are two big stories if we look, that I'd see here, if we look wider at the the sort of settlement areas around and near this ritual center. First, the building of these arrays, uh, the associated ritual burials, the grave goods, indicate some kind of level of political concentration, sufficient already by the fifth millennium BCE for mobilizing a large labor force and keeping it at work over an extended period. Uh, so in an all likelihood, Nabta lay in the lands of a state of some kind, a small state or centralized early big chiefdom, centuries before in, uh, such consolidation, at least in most parts of, of Egypt. And there's a second inference. The very existence of the megalithic arrays tell us there must have existed some kind of formal priesthood. You need people who formally cultivate the necessary astronomical expertise and carry out the ritual responsibilities related to that expertise. Now, second part of that story, if the initial studies of Nabta are correct, several notable features of the megalithic sites presage the cosmology of Old Kingdom Egypt. Most notably, in ancient Egypt, the heliacal rising of Sirius, 
uh, was connected uh, as a key event for calibrating the calendar. Uh, the two other knob to playa alignments connect up with ideas about life and death in ancient Egypt. The belt of Orion came to be associated particularly with Osiris, afterlife, death, resurrection, fertility of the land, a, a lot of things actually with Osiris who became quite a noted god. Um, the third Napto Orion, the longest one, pointed to the northern parts of the sky where the stars are always above the horizon, to the part of the sky where in ancient Egyptian thought the stars never die. So, now in the middle, and the second half of the fourth millennium, the middle of the, sort of the middle and the second half of the uh, third, fourth millennium, there's evidence of continuing residential and political growth of scale uh, in Upper Egypt and in uh, parts of Nubia as well, inhabited by Nilo Saharan peoples. Uh, in fact, uh, the leading kingdom, here's a couple of towns south of Egypt uh, of that era, uh, the leading kingdom from a roughly 3600 down to maybe 3300 BCE uh, may well have been, had its center in the Nilo-Saharan speaking lands immediately south of Upper Egypt. Uh, its sort of center, its royal burial locations were at Kustul, which you see up there in the next to the last line. And it's on your maps. I tried to write a little bigger and put a red line under it. Um, uh, the archaeologist Bruce Williams uh, first brought, uh, put a spotlight on the, this polity in his work four decades ago. And what I'm discovering, and it also was interesting going to a conference I went to just a couple months ago at, um, at uh, uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara. Recent work confirms many of William's ideas, and this work is beginning to reveal that, if anything, the Kustul state may have been even more influential than William's first proposed. And here's my comment that we lead to. From cultural remains and sites far off in what is today the Western Desert, as well as extending east from the Nile, we're not sure how much further into the eastern desert, it now appears that the Kustul state held cultural, if not outright political hegemony over a wide expanse of territories and peoples. Along the Nile and far out, notice the two in the west, far out uh, away from the river into what would then have been western grassland steppe rather than western desert. Ah. But then, around 3350 BCE, give, give or take a decade or two or, or three, a transformative climatic collapse changed everything. The Eastern Sahara rapidly shifted over the final drying out to the arid kind of climate it has today, changing from steppe grassland uh, supportive of pastoral pursuits to bare desert in most areas. And now east, not so much because there's some rain coming from the Red Sea into the Red Sea Hills, but certainly close to the river on both sides and all the way out westward. So an immediate demographic consequence appears to have been that the peep pastoralists out in the emerging desert resettled among the communities along the Nile itself. With this climate collapse, the Nile finally became what we only too often and wrongly assume it to always have been, this narrow corridor of reliably habitable land with a reliable water supply located in the midst of a vast, extremely dry desert. The Nabda Playa site was abandoned. The Kustul Kingdom, with the loss of its outlying population, sharply declined in wealth and power uh, between 3300 and 3100 BCE. This is something that uh, Williams discerned in the record already uh, 30, 30 or more years ago. And now we can look at it with the climate evidence and say, oh yeah, now we can see why. But in Upper Egypt, the movement of people to the river, I would argue at least, helped to set up an opposite trend. With vastly more arable land in long continuous stretches, in lower Nubia at least, the patches of arable land are separated by rocky patches of river. And they're narrow and small. But Egypt, long stretch right off 
northward up the Nile, down the Nile, sorry. There we go, I almost did upper and lower all over again. Anyway, so with vastly more arable land and with a continuous run of such land, different rulers in Upper Egypt could come to rule over territories with much greater populations than could be sustained any longer south of Aswan, at least until you got up to Upper, uh, upper, to upper Nubia. And among other things, they would now be able to field larger armies because they had more people to draw on. Now, along with this great and abrupt demographic shift, uh, and I suspect uh, that it was very possibly set in motion indeed by the social and political disruptions of the demographic change, a succession of new developments of lasting historical significance took shape in the last three centuries BCE. Uh, the emergence of one or more large polities. Well, I got myself too far ahead, didn't I? Gotta watch out for me here. Uh, one or more large polities initially in the regions of the Nakada culture in Upper Egypt, the invention of writing, and finally, by around 3100 BCE and the 31st century BCE, the conquest and establishment of the Old Kingdom, unifying all the Nile regions from Aswan to the Delta. And also one of the things that happened here during that period in the 31st century, uh, there was a major raid southward that under Aha, Hor Aha, which apparently was meant to depopulate what the people that were there because apparently they considered the Kustul region to be an area of potential danger. And so we see a, a real, uh, it's a real cutting down of the population. They seem to have driven people out and deliberately made sure that that land wasn't going to be a, a threat in the future. Now, even then, the Old Kingdom continued to have cultural things that showed the wider connection to the Middle Nile cultural world. And one kind of indication, of course, were the celestial ideas and imageries. In addition, it appears that a notable ritual practice with its origins farther south played a role in early royal observances of the uh, Old Kingdom. During the first dynasty of Old Kingdom Egypt, royal tombs at Abydos, it now appears, contained not just the graves of the rulers themselves, but also the graves of a large number, adjacent, adjacent graves, a large number of high status individuals buried next to the king, apparently to accompany and look after him in the afterlife. As many as uh, 300 people in the case of the second king, uh, even 135 subsidiary graves in the case of the fifth ruler. So some things to be learned there and maybe tried to be better understood. Now this ritual treatment of the king's death was similarly practiced early in Nubia. And it was a ritual feature present still in the high age of the Kerma kingdom of upper Nubia in the second millennium BCE. And more than that, this is a ritual practice that historians have encountered in the history of a number of later Nilo-Saharan speaking uh, or Nilo-Saharan influenced kingdoms in the Sudan belt of Africa, from pre-Christian Nubia uh, to as far west uh, and as late as the empire of the Ghana in the, around the uh, 8th or 9th, maybe as late as the 10th century CE, AD. So now Egypt in this light is best understood not as the source of the practice, but as a portion of the Middle Nile culture area that may for a time have had this custom, but not as deeply rooted maybe in local culture, uh, it dropped back out of use. Uh, by the way, of course, we don't know that people were executed to go into the afterlife. They may each as they died in their turn been buried. So we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're not prejudging just how this happened. Wanna now, hmm? <laughs> want to bet? Yeah, I know you're right. <laughs> But we'll give people an opt-out if they want to. Okay, to sum up, the second story of the Africanity of Egypt is a story of how the institutions and ideas that we see in the ritual, for instance, of the Old Kingdom of Egypt took shape during the 6th to 4th millennia BCE within this wider multi-ethnic sphere of cultural interaction and cultural convergence, the Middle Nile culture area, at least as I call it. And it's a story of how quite a number, 
maybe many of the notable cultural features in Egypt had their origins among Nilo-Saharan neighbors of theirs to the south. Now, I want to close today with two proposals for critical rethinking by historians, and I hope by all of us. First, it's well past time, I think, for a critical re-examination of the use by historians and by all of us of the word civilization. Okay, The building of monuments, the producing of elaborate art, does not mean that the people of such societies were somehow smarter, somehow more able than the rest of us. What monument building actually testifies to is the growth of wealth and power and the con growing concentration of that wealth and power in the hands of the few. It's the centralized control of institutions and of the ide ideologies of power that enabled kings to draft the necessary labor forces. It's you know, your ritual responsibility. It's not because you have to enslave people to build the, uh, the pyramids. This is... This is your cultural responsibility to the people who have the ritual power and position. It is the concentration of wealth and ideological power that gave both royalty and priesthoods the means to support professional artists and to commission their artistic works. And we know that from medieval Europe or other places just as well. And, uh, you know, now we can, and I think we should indeed, appreciate the human accomplishments of these worlds. But I'd rather call these societies by terms more materially and objectively descriptive of their features. They were early centralized, stratified, unequal societies. They were urban societies in the sense that they possessed at least some towns and cities. Actually, the word civilization once used to really originally mean you had towns, but that's not the way we use it anymore. And, but along with valuing their accomplish, accomplishments, we ought to be as direct and unblinking in our historic evaluations of their failings as we are of those of the unequal and oppressive societies of recent history. And there's a further related point. There are more ways for us to exist, and I think this is really important for historians everywhere, than just in larger stratified societies. It's long past time that smaller scale societies receive proper historical attention. It's harder often to give them the attention, but they deserve it, and all the more so when you consider that in the African case, and actually not just in Africa, but in other parts of the world too, it was people living in small-scale societies who produced some of the most notable early technological advances. And I talked about ones uh, in a previous day, uh, those in Africa where that happened. And it happened in small-scale societies. Egypt is a place where the inventions of smaller-scale societies, that knowledge crossed. And it could be fruitfully made use of, but it isn't necessarily, necessarily the region where they started. It's way where they end up, and they cause fruitful interaction. Uh, so, my second closing thought. We do no service to the project of giving Africa its just historical due if we continue to plant our feet in one region of the continent and look outward. One of the problems in world history is people plant their feet somewhere in Eurasia, and they look outward at the rest of the world when they try to write their world history books. All we've done is plant our feet a little farther southward, not in the Levant or the Mesopotamia or southern Europe, but in Egypt. To make Egypt the source for the rest of Africa of some abstract quality or maybe mythical quality of civilization is still to treat the rest of Africa as peripheral to world history, to continue to treat the accomplishment of the rest of Africa's peoples as derivative. Africans everywhere on the continent, well, the further you get away from the middle of the world, the more you are, but anyway, so if you live up in the Arctic and Siberia, you know, you're kind of getting toward the edge. But Africans nearly everywhere on the continent were not off the edge of history. Instead, they were innovative, contributors in integral ways, and participants in each of the uh, major transitions of long Holocene age. That was my sort of topic for last time. 
And they did not need some special people in one part of the continent to bring these developments to them. Africans in West and Central Africa were historical and technological innovators, innovators in their own right, possessing, for example, ceramic technology long before Egypt and even longer maybe before the Middle East. And it now appears earlier having iron technology as well. So it's long past time to give all of Africa its proper due in the history of mankind. And I hope we are able to somehow move that venture forward. It's a difficult one to do. We live in a cultural world that we didn't make, but we're in it, so there we are. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Thank you, Chris. It's been a marvelous uh, lecture series and a fantastic lecture today. Uh, and I know there'll be a lot of questions and a lot of comment before we ask uh, everyone to join us to celebrate Chris's lecture with food and drink at the back of the room. But it's obvious that what you're doing and other scholars, uh, I remember the first uh, shocking time I saw this argument, Emmanuel was reading as a graduate student, Sheikh Antadiyah, and he said, all these historians start in Mesopotamia or wherever, and then go, I, I can't say down the Nile because it's the wrong way, but go from the north of the Nile toward the equator, when civilization starts at the equator and goes north. And that in various ways, it's not, not all the way down the equator, but that is what all of your evidence is, is showing that there is a south to north movement rather than yeah. things fl floating down the Nile or up the Nile, <laughs> you know, from Europe in some uh, mysterious, mysterious way. Why do you think it's been that way? I mean, the simple answer is your ending, which is that we're all uh, photocentric, right? It's wherever our feet are standing when we're writing. That's how we, we see the world. Mm -hmm. But why wouldn't that occur to people? that ideas and culture would flow the way the Nile flowed, rather than the reverse way? Well, one kind of simple answer is the ethnocentrism. I mean, the, all these people wanting, they discover in Europe, ancient Egypt, and say, oh, uh, must be people like us. Uh, well, no. Um, and so I, I think we start out with those sorts of viewpoints, but we also have the horrific history in between of people needing to cut parts of Africa out of their perception of things, otherwise they're going to have to accept the guilt and the horror of what they're doing. So, um, you know, I, I think those things, people don't even necessarily consciously word those things. However, if you look at the um, this Confederate States documents of secession, yeah, they, they, do, they are very clear in their nastiness. So, um, I, I think really that's more of it, but it's also because we each start from areas. Now, as far as Africa goes, Europeans and Middle Easterners and East Asian people are used to trying to find written records of things. So we have to retool ourselves to understand how much we can get from the other kind of records. So that very fact oh, we can read and write, they can't or something. Well, they didn't choose to, but uh, they chose to be an oral society and have elaborate uh, representations and presentations and continuing of things. But, um, so we start out with a deficit because we're starting with the presumption of what is going to give us historical ev evidence. We start out with a deficit uh, understanding for how we can do it for the other areas of the world. Now, you can see, however, if you can get really big buildings, then at least the Europeans got really excited. So therefore, hey, the Incas didn't read, didn't write, but they built big buildings and they conquered people. So we're also seeing a perception of the world like that. If you're powerful and you have wars and defeat people, somehow that makes you better and stronger too, which is, I hope, we're going through the phase of history. I'll never live long enough to see the result when we'll finally get rid of that sort of idea too. But anyway, 
I'm going off on too many things. Yeah, thank you. I'm over here. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, lecture. I have a... Um, a My comment. hearing is coming from there. Excellent. Good. <laughs> so everybody's right there. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I have a comment and then a question. And my comment sort of goes to this latter point in the issue of civilization and creativity, invention, etc. And, and I would say simply from the vantage point of the history of art, in much of Africa, there's as much creativity and uh, mm. production of art and new ideas yeah. within the non-royal, non-hierarchical groups as there are within the others. And indeed, in Congo, Benin, elsewhere, there's often a real push to force each person who comes on the throne to move the capital, uh, to create a new palace, et cetera, not only bringing together labor, but also mm -hmm forcing internally a means of really challenging the status quo. And so there are kind of interesting things there. So that would be my comment in terms of as we're rethinking civilization. Um, but I have a, 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 and I'm not sure if you're able to put up your wonderful chart of the languages that you had early on. It's a question related to that. And some work that I've been doing in the area of northern Cameroon, near Chad, and that area. And as you pointed out in your chart, the um, Hausa language family and the is closely linked with the Coptic language family in a wide variety of ways. And indeed, they use a Coptic <coughs> calendar. But more recently, I've found some really interesting DNA evidence. Um, why DNA in particular? that links an area in this region, which is a mountain area now dominated by Boko Haram because it has such great view shed yeah. on the whole trading network, and spoke with a DNA expert, one that Skip uses, who argues that uh, most likely this is coming from after 2500 BCE, mm -hmm. and not earlier. And, and I've been one of those who's been arguing pretty strongly for an, an important east-west route from the mm -hmm. Nile uh, um, westward, or from the niger Benue mm -hmm. eastward, as a, a probably in the medieval period, controlled by mm -hmm. cops and others. And I'm just wondering, within this context of language, I think that there's enough evidence material evidence on the ground to suggest this, and it's a well-watered route as well, because it was once the Yellow Nile and full of wadis. Uh, but the kind of linguistic one, evidence one would use to, uh, let's say, argue um, that you could, this could not have been coming later, but necessarily had to be coming earlier for that correlationship between yeah. the Coptic and the Hausa language families. Yeah. Well, the, the language relationships are in the order of 10,000 years, but the, the, um, uh, I know this genetic material, which is interesting, and we are having discussions trying to see how to fit it into the rest of the genetics. Um, now, the, the Chadic group moved into an area with largely Nilo-Saharan people, and it shows up in their genetics with only a certain amount of their genetic background from the more ancient coming from the edge of the, from the Nile direction. Now, as to uh, uh, African movements, there were, what I talked about uh, last time was about, for those who weren't available here, one of the big themes was that there was a West African commercial revolution beginning as long ago as 1800 BCE. And it, this becomes a very extensive network of interactions, the movement of goods, manufacturers uh, with uh, interesting new kinds of town formations taking place and so on. What we don't have is, a, is knowledge of a nice area we'd really love to have uh, right on through uh, Aneti and across uh, to northern parts of modern day Sudan. Uh, there are the evidence, people now interpreting things like Harkouf's trips as actually going well out to the west and so we have the possibility of this area being also an early area of long distance trade connections where people could have moved along these connections and then got involved in trade in the West African trade commercial network and moved up into the hills perhaps to carry on connections and married locally and, and have something to do with us. So there are possibilities that way. Do you have a follow-up? No? Sounds good. Questions? Coming behind you. There you go. 
Thank you. I'm Gloria Amagwali from Central Connecticut State University. So I came up here to hear you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I haven't been disappointed. I want to ask you a few questions, though. Um, Afrasan versus Afrasian. I noticed in your first edition you said Afrasan. In well, the second the, edition you said Afrasian. So yeah. well, it's, it's a little thing. But. I, I thought, well, I'll just make it short for people. It was stupid of me. Because it really makes more sense to be Afrasian. That's okay. the short way of saying Afroasiatic. And it mm -hmm. basically, it's a Northeast African language family with this one little offshoot Semitic that gets all the historical attention and whatever. So it's kind of too bad that it's even called Afroasiatic. But mm -hmm. that's also a name that's well in it. So I have often also use Afroasiatic, but I, I probably am going to go back to that, except for, for students, it's better to have a shorter term. So Afrasian is what I've gone to. So I, I'd rather like Afrasian, but now okay. I'd better not like it, right? Well, well, please, if more people tell me that, when we have a third edition, we'll go back to it. <laughs> OK. I, I am thinking that um, you know this upper lower thing, it really, you know, I used to have to concentrate, OK, yes, you know. You know for, maybe it's just, we should just be talking about north and south. That's it. You know, north and south, and probably in brackets, put you know whatever we want to put there. Uh, yeah, um, I thought too that you know Afro Asian, uh, Afro Asiatic. I, I agree with Obenga that that name should change, uh, and um, I, I think we should still try our best to get a better terminology instead of um, of that. The language map, though, I, I see a disconnect between the map and the idea of Afro-Asiatic as such starting in the area south of the confluence. But I may be wrong, probably well, that, I'm missing Well, that's an Isla Saharan family. Yeah, but I mean, I'm looking at the map. Uh, but anyway. Well, I'm sorry, yeah, I need your advice, thank you. That, you know, came to, to me. Now, uh, do you agree with the thesis, though, that, you know, Sarurab, I think is the name of the place, would have parts dated to about 12,000 what, what uh, BC. Sarurab in the Sudan. But anyway, that hmm. came to my mind um, as you were talking, and then I recalled also that we have some parts dated about uh, 9,400 BC in the Malian region, mm -hmm. based yep. on the work of Husekar, this, this is what right? I, this is what I talked about in a pre previous talk. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. I missed that. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that so that came to my mind. Now I take it, of course, that um, Tasseti and Kustul would mm -hmm. be synonymous, so sort of, you know, referring to the same thing. Or, or can you? Uh, well, sorry, Kustul and what? Tasseti. Oh, I see. Yeah, Tasseti is Kustul. Absolutely. Oh, oh yeah. okay. But it was, right. yeah, yeah, the oh. the land of the bow people, the bowmen. Yeah. Thank you so much for the the comments on Bruce Williams. I think this guy is a pioneer of, you know, excellent pioneer, okay. and he has been not to recognize as, as much. Thank you so much for recognizing yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. I was going to say, by the way, we do have some genetics which fits with the movement from, uh, so in your uh, bibliography, I put, um, there's a notable article by Shomarka Keita, which um, uh, shows how the genetic, there's this one set of especially Y chromosome genetics that maps out with the language spread that we've talked about. It gets all the way to the Middle East and it gets clear across to the Amazigh and so on. So. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask uh, two questions. One, you used a, a, a term, Afian. Uh, could you explain that? Well, Afian is the name they give to a particular. Afian and Qadan are two cultures that turn up at the same time, mm -hmm. are, seem virtually varieties of the same, um, bringing in the uh, wild grain collection at 15,000 BCE. That's the name they give to this new culture. Oh, the archaeologist. An archaeological. Yeah, it's an archaeological name. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, the other question was: Was there, 
was there a King Mena or not? And, and, and if so, what's the evidence? Is, is yeah. this Narmer the same person? Or? Yeah, that's, that's, that's Thank you. what we have is masses of debate on that, yeah. <laughs> there are, uh, one argument could be that Horaha uh, is, or just Aha, was the actual sort of founding king that really put the kingdom together, that he's the, the, the real name at the time of the name, whatever the nickname Menes came from. Uh, that this would have been, this would have been the person who was that person. Other people feel that maybe Narmer is the one that should be fit into the category of menace. But okay, and Horaha is the one with the documents, uh, the monument showing that he went down and cleaned up, so to speak, in a nasty way. Did a uh, sort of a like our president and the Kurds did this to. Uh, Tosetti. So anyway, uh, so he may have been the person to put the whole show together. And they did see that region as a, a core region of danger where armies could come. And the, the, uh, Bruce Williams has came up with pictorial documents from Kustul, which show the foot of who needs to be the king of Kustul standing on Upper Egypt, yeah. claiming that they had conquered parts of Upper Egypt. So, yeah. Uh, there is a relationship there that's significant as well to know about. We may have Nilo-Saharan conquest of Egypt before the 25th dynasty. So. Hmm? Skip likes to do that too. <laughs> so uh, I... I it, <laughs> the... Uh, I, I was, I've been reflecting on early cartography. I know we've talked about uh, you know, the influences of, of early European scholarship and uh, you refer to hermetic things. And, but I'm also going back looking at even the Greco-Egyptian and the early beginnings of cartography mm -hmm. picked up uh, by Arab cartographers. Mm -hmm. and how they represented space. Uh -huh. And there's a sense in which uh, uh, the further you went down in, in Africa, they assumed nothing was happening. <laughs> and so there's a sense in which even the very beginnings of the representation, or the special mm -hmm. representation of space, yeah. almost kind of ignored much of Africa. The northern part was part of the Mediterranean world. It was mm. part of this world. Uh, and, and so I was, I've been reflecting on that. I mean, when you we're, we're trying to figure out whether it is Upper Egypt or Lower Egypt, and we need to turn it around. But, but there's a sense in which it doesn't matter how the river flowed. According to these early cartographers, nothing much was happening as you went further south. Mm -hmm. And it's just something I've been reflecting on. Mm. Well, you know this is a human thing. I'm seeing in modern American politics, there's a whole bunch of Americans who really don't know Diddley. And they're saying, well, it's not really happening because I don't know about it. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is what people do. You say, well, it couldn't be worthwhile. I don't know about it. And then that keeps your ego in contact. and contact and not falling apart on you and so it's um, you know surely if it was something happening there we'd know about it so you know I think that's just what human beings do and the further they got away from the early people who made maps on written sort of maps you know I discovered of course working in the field uh, way off in the country in Tanzania people could just could draw a map so people can all do this they tell me, hey, well, you're going to get to this guy's house. Look, here's it. And they draw a map on the sand or the, or the earth there. So people, we have this natural capacity. So anyway, that's kind of another side topic rather than anything else. But, uh, where, yeah. where were you working in Tanzania? Uh, kind of the northwest, the, the west, the northeast, the center. Everything but the southeast, kind of one one time or another, traveled to people. Yeah. No, I lived in a, a little village called Kilimatindi, 
about four hours from Dodoma with the Gogo people yeah. when I was 19. Yeah, yeah. So I was curious. Yes, uh, hands. Matt, times. call on people. Thank you. Um, I, I hesitate to display ignorance in this company since African history, especially way back, is not my field. But I am curious about the name Africa. I know it's what the Romans called the, yeah. the place. Called and Tunisia, yeah. Yes. It's from a, a tribal name in North Africa? Well, stru it? yeah, structurally, what you can tell mm -hmm. looking at it, it has the absolute, the, the vowel and consonant sequence and type of structure of an Amazigh, a Berber name. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. Begins with a vowel A or E, mm -hmm. and then has three consonants. Oh, it's perfect. So it has to be some Berber regional name. Mm -hmm. And I would think in that area, it would have been more an aerial or regional name mm -hmm. rather than an ethnic group name. But why would the Romans have know. chosen it? I mean, why did it become the name for the yeah. entire continent? Yeah. Yeah. Tail wagging the dog. <laughs> yeah, that is so, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, interesting question. Because what happens is people start drawing maps in the Roman period, then their sense of what might be Africa gets this widening, but how we then, through the medieval Europeans or something, decided to take the whole of the continent. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, there, there's my ignorance, so maybe someone else knows. Sorry. We have a hand a couple places here. Sorry. And one thing, by the way, is, I think is very important, is we always should admit our own ignorance of things. We really get ourselves in holes if we don't. And we learn so much more if we say, you know, I don't know about that. So. Well, thank you for an eye-opening, fascinating lecture. I, uh, I'm in, intrigued absolutely by your uh, language family tree. I was looking here for Meroitic and well, I, Meroitic needs to be an Eastern Sudanic language of the Nilo-Saharan family. There are several things that do that. Um, that. That seems to be when people have dug into it, that's what they feel is true. I would also. I also can bring another kind of evidence. There are loan words, words borrowed, into uh, Nubian Nile languages that come from some other Nilo-Saharan language I can show their borrowings because they don't have the right sound correspondence, but they're not Saharan. And the people who would have been there should have been Meroitic speaking, so I'm presuming that's an indirect indicator as well, that they were Eastern Sudanic, Eastern Sahelian branch of not Saharan. So, anyway. Uh, fascinating. I, I've also, I no language, uh, specialist by any means, but I've, I've also heard that uh, there are cognates in, as far west as Chad. Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, there are um, language families that relate to Meroitic as far west as Chad. Uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah, you know, because the Nilo Saharan family goes as far as, as Songhai on the bend of the Niger. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where the family goes. Now, one thing you'll mm -hmm. discover is that uh, there are there are not very many people who really seriously are historical linguists anymore. Mm -hmm. Because once uh, no, uh, Chomsky came along, it was you'd show you were more intellectual and really smart if you did obscure grammatical things. Um, so you don't necessarily get enough people getting in the field. So what happens with uh, at the African cases, you've got some people that really, they're still doing a bunch of other studies, but on the side they may do some language relationship, and they, they don't see the big picture a lot of times. And a second thing to notice, if you have a language in a family that's the only language of its branch, it's all by itself in its branch, well, the more languages you have in a branch still spoken, the more chances you'll find, oh, here's the ancient word, these two don't have it, but that one does, and oh, here's another one in that, but it's not in the other two. You have only one, it becomes harder to find the evidence. So there's a bunch of people that want to make Songhai into something else all its own because it's the only langu language of its branch. And it's several thousand years time depth from any nearer relationship, probably six, probably 7,000 years. That makes it hard. So you will find arguments about whether it really works or not. 
Uh, I'm saying this because I want you all to accept what I did rather than what anyone else says. But, but, um, but I did do, in, for Nilo Saharan too, I did deep, intense uh, family, language to language, working out the sound correspondences and doing a bunch of things. And uh, there aren't many people interested or really directly concerned to grapple with these issues. So things are kind of sitting in stasis, but I go ahead and use them anyway. So. Hello. I would like to piggyback off of my professor and say thank you for mentioning Bruce Williams. Um, this is a man who wrote eight monographs on the excavations in yeah. Nubia. And they However, are such detailed, such, right. such, yeah. However, all the texts that I've read, a lot of them, they won't even mention him. They won't even say his name. Um, I would like to know how you feel about when he talked about the Kustul in, uh, incense burner from Tassetti. Yeah. And he actually explained that it definitely still is a form of writing mm -hmm. on the Kustul incense burner. So yeah. can we say that writing literally came from Nubia? Uh, if, it, it, you know, it, yeah. considering I mean, the incense burner and it seems to be something yeah. that no one wants yeah. to, like Markowitz and yeah. Taxi, um, yep. I mean, we need another century or two before we're actually seeing for sure we've got writing in Egypt. Okay. And this would give us that. But yes. I think also the the pictorial documents we're mm -hmm. beginning. This this is a creation, mm -hmm. initial form of writing itself. Right. So I phonetic so, symbols. So, I, so so if you have the collapse of the climate, mm -hmm. you have the chance for these things to. Now their idea is to stimulate the change that we then that people do admit to, right? Uh, north of the the first cataract. So he also talks about the fact that the Nubians and the Egyptians were basically like they had a familial relationship. Mm -hmm. It's almost like uh, cousins in the north and the south. Yeah, you know they they were more familiar. It wasn't they weren't more enemies. They were more like. Fighting cousins, almost. You know, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. They, they they did, but I have a cousin who might want to kill me. I mean, so. I mean, it happens. However, there was there was less distinction between the two civilizations, which I think oh, that well, they were. This is very what I tried. This is what Wengro and people are saying. Mm -hmm. This was cultural convergence. Right. They're okay. all one world. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so you do agree that we need to bring Bruce Williams out more in his For work. heaven's sakes. Okay. Yeah, he, but by the way, he was at the meeting and people still oh. invite him and uh, I've got to see him again. I hadn't seen him cool. for quite a few years. Well, I've um, never met him. Hopefully yeah. I will. Yeah. Well, there's a book <laughs> which I didn't bring here. Mm -hmm. um, Egypt before the pyramids, is it? Anyway, there's nice. a recent book that's connected with a, a museum exhibit. Okay. But he's got an article in there. There's a whole bunch of fun articles in there that pull all these things together uh, mm -hmm. where you can see a lot of what you're saying. So Yeah, because yeah. I went to the Boston Museum real quick, and, yeah. and I asked a woman at the Boston Museum, actually literally asked about his work and said his name, and the woman had no idea yeah. who yeah. he was. So well, I you was know, a little shocked we're, over Yeah, you that. know what we're dealing mm -hmm. with. We're dealing with the issues that I'm raising about this idea of civilization and whatever, yeah. and all the racist ideas about how Egyptians fit in the world compared to people south of Egypt. It's just, oh my God. So, you know, like, um, well, my, why is Bruce Williams so, is he black or something? I mean, why is he <laughs> black? No? Why is people so hard on the brother? No, it, it's They're so hard on him because he's actually saying exactly what Mr. Era is saying, in my opinion, and is that, yeah. There's a south to north migration of people, and that the culture basically started there and not in Egypt. And he's definitely letting people know that Egypt is in Africa and also of Africa. So I liked when you said that it was of, because I read that in the book and wanted to throw the book across the room. It made no sense. Yeah to say Egypt is in Africa, but it's not of Africa. Yeah. So it didn't make any well, sense. And I literally no. read that in a, in a book. So when you said yeah. that, I was like, yes. But yeah, I well, that's what, that's what my 
first several sentences today were about exactly. <laughs> exactly that. This is ridiculous. We're dealing with centuries of the need of people north to have a particular view of the world. And, and you have, and look, it's become, it's so important for many, certain older Egyptologists, they have this idea in their head. And they, they can't imagine the world could be different. Right. And you, you see, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, the guy who grew up in the Navajo Reservation. Uh, there's someone else I know well and shows my age. I'm losing names. Anyway, wrote this. Hmm? Who? Fred No, no, uh, not Fred, but uh, uh, anyway. Um, Whatever. The, the deal is he came out right away with an article after Bruce Williams came out saying, oh, well, there may have been some chiefdoms down there or something, but there's not really kingdoms. And no, you had no basis. He had no basis for saying that. He didn't confront the evidence that Bruce gave him. Well, so anyway, you know, thanks to Chris Ayer, Charles Bonet, Rita Freed, and other brilliant scholars, we know the truth here. And that's the way it is. Let's give it up for Christopher Eret for a brilliant, brilliant Thank series you. of lectures. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Alan. Please join us for food and drink at the back of the room before he, we spirit him.